Muchas gracias, Josep. Thank you, Jose. And now I am going to introduce Professor Tony Bush, who is the Chair of Educational Leadership at the University of Nottingham. And he has come all the way from Nottingham to participate in our symposium. He's also director of one of the most prestigious journals at a world level in the field of educational leadership. It's called Educational Management Administration and Leadership. And his book on educational leadership, theories on educational leadership and management, has already been translated into uh, many languages. So it's a pleasure for us to have him here with us today. Thank you, Professor Bush. I'm hoping that my presentation will soon appear. <laughs> do I have to do that? Okay, thank you. Well, good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great uh, pleasure for me to be here this afternoon and throughout the symposium. And I want to thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to be here and for thanking you for being here at the end of two busy days so I'm going to be speaking about why lead whole child development. We've heard a lot about that from previous speakers and panelists uh, yesterday and again today. So let me say, first of all, what I'm going to try to do with this presentation. So first of all, I want to explore the meaning of whole child development. And of course, many of you in the room will have great experience of that and know more about that than I do. And I want to talk about the ways in which the pandemic has changed the view about what student outcomes means and what it means to balance academic outcomes and wider what people in earlier sessions have called holistic outcomes for our students. Then I want to say a little bit about what we understand by the term vision. We've heard vision many, many, many times in the last day and a half, but I suggest to you, and with due respect to the other presenters, perhaps we haven't entirely clarified how we understand that term and how it links to purpose. I also want to consider with you who owns the vision? Whose vision is it? And when we talk rather too easily about the notion of shared vision, shared by whom and with whom, is a key question I want to address. Then I want to talk about the role of leadership in generating school improvement and then to compare different approaches to leadership, which in my own writing I call leadership models. So what do we understand by whole child development? And of course you will all have your own views about this and I understand that it's very important here in Spain and also in Portugal. So I understand it is development that goes beyond formal academic outcomes. And I've heard people speaking, I think, with passion and with reason and meaning about unleashing all the talents of our children and students, not just those that are most easily measurable, not just those that are valued by government and by employers, all their talents. So I've said something about that here. What we do find, though, is that all governments almost everywhere, and I cannot speak of Spain when I say this, are mesmerized by the Programme for International Student Assessment Rankings. Mesmerized. And don't like it if the country isn't doing very well. And of course, I can also say to you, as you will well understand, League tables are very easy to understand. And we all enjoy them, whether that's in football or whether that's in education. But they can also be very meaningless. 
and not focused on whole child development, focused on a very narrow set of measures, specifically language and mathematics and science. And the danger is that those aspects are the only aspects that will be valued. And that is a huge danger because it marginalizes children and students whose talents lie elsewhere. So even within the formal curriculum, subjects may be important. Uh, like history and geography and ICT and languages and sport and music and drama are completely marginalized. So what does that mean for students whose talents lie in those areas but are not valued? The other issue that I think has become through very strongly since the pandemic is that we as a collective of educators have given insufficient attention to student welfare. The pandemic has made us rethink our priorities. Children are not learning machines and their welfare has been severely compromised by the pandemic, as I'm sure many of you are only too well aware. So let me now share with you, some of you may well be aware of this already, some selected rankings for the Programme for International Student Assessment, which, as I say, is very important to many political leaders and senior administrators. Just selected countries, and my Spain is not there because I, for I understand technical reasons, it's not there, but you will see Portugal listed there. What can you deduce from this listing? What can you see from there about the countries represented and those not represented? So let me first of all say there are no African countries in the top 20. There are no South American countries there either. And we make the distinction now between the global north and the global south. Not much presence from the global south with the disadvantages that they have economically and socially and in so many other ways. So what you can see in the top 10 are seven Asian countries. What is that telling us? Is that telling us that they privilege the formal curriculum over whole child development? Or is it for other reasons? Europe, though, does very well, doesn't it, if you look at the overall rankings across that top 20. So this is important. Political leaders like it. Political leaders often frame their educational reform policies in terms of this, I've recently done research in Malaysia, which lags behind many other Asian countries, and the whole of their 300-page reform document is about improving their position in the PISA rankings. It's a major driver for reform. So let's think about what's happened post-pandemic. And many speakers have said something about this already. So the dominance of the formal curriculum has been challenged during and since the COVID-19 pandemic. Many children and families found that a very difficult period. And the shift to online or hybrid learning has accentuated social disadvantage. In Europe, we've gone through decades of gradually and slowly and painstakingly reducing the learning gaps between the privileged and the underprivileged. That has been reversed by the impact of the COVID pandemic. There's differential access to digital devices. Teachers had to upskill their pedagogy rapidly. And home learning is a challenge in some families. I recently completed another project on leading learning for girls' education in Zimbabwe. And what did we find there? Most families only had one smartphone, if they had anything at all. And so children couldn't do the learning set by their teachers until their parents finished work in the evening. So the normal learning time was lost to those children. So those learning gaps have increased across social classes. What we also know from the research, and I've published really quite a lot of this research in my own journal, children displayed a range of emotions in this period. Anxiety, mental health problems, concern about being unable to relate to their friends. 
this brings home to us in a very sharp way the need for a whole child development policy. So we've heard a lot about vision. I've been very interested in uh, sitting in a privileged position in the front row in the reserved seats. Thank you very much, organisers. Uh, hearing many speakers and panellists speaking about vision, and it's something that I've written about quite extensively myself. So one, de one common definition that vision is a dream of a better future for the school and for the members of the school, by which I mean students, teachers, leaders, parents, and the wider community. What we sometimes call stakeholders. It's a key exercise sometimes to ask ourselves the question, who are the stakeholders or the owners, in inverted commas, of our schools? And I don't mean the official owners, government of public schools and so on. I mean those with an emotional attachment to that school. That's what I call ownership in this sense. And so we expect, increasingly expect, leaders and others to become engaged in vision building moving towards the better future. And there's interesting issues. Who defines this better future? What does the better future look like? How does it improve on the present and the past? And that can be a challenge. It connects, of course, to the aims of the school. What are we trying to do? And this is at a very high level, the dream of the better future. At a very practical level, what are we doing on Monday morning? I think that's very important, and we've heard some really exciting presentations and comments from people here about the way things happen in their own schools. And even if they didn't call it vision, I could interpret it as being about their vision for their school. And so it seems to me that vision, as far as possible, should be related to the specific needs of the school. But that then raises the key question about who develops the vision who owns the vision, who interprets the vision, and who implements the vision. And where does it come from? In my view, the vision needs to be strongly informed by the values of the stakeholders involved in that process. But who are they? So what I've found interesting in, with some of the presentations, I've had some what seem like really exciting initiatives going on in schools, but leaders nevertheless saying quietly or not so quietly, we are constrained by what the government tells us to do. And was it one person yesterday speaking about the 200 forms they needed to fill in and this kind of thing? And I can be quite, I can, I can be quite I'm flying back tomorrow, so I can be quite firm and I say to leaders, what will happen, do you think, if you don't fill in the forms? What would happen to you? Just to step away and maybe think about it. What would be the consequence of that? Because you decided not to fill in the forms, but to go and work alongside a teacher in the classroom, to talk to children who have difficulties, to engage with families. But somehow the government thinks it's more important for you to fill in some forms. What would happen if you don't? And then I also say to them, and because it may be very different here in Spain, what happens to the forms when you submit them? to the government, and the answer is they tick off that they've received it from you and it goes in the file. Or is it different here? Is it meaningful? Or is it bureaucratic, narrow, procedural accountability? I'll leave you to think about that. I know plenty of places where it's the second of the two options that I've just outlined to you. So professional values are very important and other values. So whose values are we talking about? Some research that was done in England really quite a long time ago now looked at vision statements across thousands of schools in England and what did they find? They were all the same. They were almost identical. 
And this led academics more radical than me to say there is only one vision and it's the one that belongs to government. But then what have we also heard constantly throughout this day and a half? The importance of context. My school is different because it serves this community, it has these children, it has these parents. So the more difference we understand in schools, the more the vision needs to be personalized to the needs of that school, those families and that community. So one size will not fit all. And I'm not sure that all governments around the world understand that. But there's a slightly different question, which I don't really have time to explore, but I'll just mention now, which is, what is the most appropriate place to locate each set of decisions that have to be made about our education, our schools and our children? We'll start from a different position. Where is it the most better place? And what we will often find is the best place for decision making is actually in the schools, not in the Ministry of Education, with due respect to the political and senior administrative leaders who are often very talented people. But they're committed to a standardized approach, a consistent approach, a one-size-fits-all approach. And I've heard leaders all over the world say to me, I've been privileged to work in 32 different countries. A government policy is okay, but it doesn't work here in my school. And they're left in that, caught in that trap of trying to make a government policy work, but knowing deep in their hearts that it can't work for their children and their families. And so that's a key question. Who owns the vision? And here I'm talking ownership emotionally, not in the sense of formal ownership or regulation. Who owns it? We've heard a lot about that since, since I've been here. So what we get then is some conflict potentially arising amongst and between the various stakeholders. Catherine earlier mentioned briefly the role of the inspection system in England. And you will appreciate that what she is doing is very different from the formal expectations of government. The inspectors are very powerful because they can name and do name and shame schools and call them inadequate. As a school leader, how would we like someone to come in Spend a short period of time in your school and then say, your school is inadequate. That's a good way of motivating for the rest of the year, isn't it? Or not. Okay. So if these conflicts arise, that can be a problem. What I, what I do say to principals when they ask me what they should do, my answer is, please interpret the policy in the context of your school not simply robotically implement it when in your heart you know it's not going to work. So it leads an interesting question about vision, which is directly relevant to this symposium. Do you believe that everyone involved in education really believes that the vision should be about whole child development, even though that is the rhetoric that we are hearing? I would like to hope so, but I'm not sure that is true. Are we doing not too bad? Because my eyes are weak, I can't see that screen over there, so forgive me for turning the pages. Um, and I don't want to turn around and, and ignore you as an audience, so forgive me for that. So the key question then for me is, even when you get to a vision that you can agree with, that your stakeholders adopt and own, that you enjoy and are happy to do, what do you do when you come to enact it? What are the challenges there? So the first step, and I heard someone speaking about this earlier, just in, I think, in the previous panel, the first thing is strategies. Can you link your strategies to your vision? Or is there inconsistency in that? So if I briefly, and forgive me for this, briefly move on to discuss something that's happened in my own university this week. Our university has a very strongly articulated program called EDI, Equality, Diversity and Inclusion. 
and it's recently appointed two members of staff, new members of staff, with the involvement of only four members of the School of Education in the appointment process. So I wrote to the head of school and said, why are you not following your own inclusion policy? So it's very easy to have a value of inclusion, great, wonderful, fantastic, but actually we're not going to include you, or you, or you, or you. So here are some challenges that we have to think about when we come to enact the vision with its values. Then you need to think about timetabling and priorities. And what I see some governments doing around the world is having an ambitious reform strategy with so many different strands. It would take Superman or Superwoman five years to implement it. What we call reform overload. And you will know, those of you working in schools, whether that applies here in Spain or not. Second issue then, okay, if we're moving forward with some of these policies, who's going to lead on them? Who's going to lead on them? And it cannot simply be the single leader, as many people have said, um, over the course of the last day and a half. And then you need to think about how you're going to move towards ach achievement. What are the steps? How will you monitor progress? And then how will you review the vision there afterwards? It's a complex process. So I do worry about those individuals who said, we, just, we need to build a vision. This is a difficult and complex process, not something that can be done easily. So if we're going to build a vision that really focuses on whole child development, as is the focus of this symposium, what do we need? And again, I've been so encouraged by hearing so many of the speakers say this over the last day and a half. All children must be valued. Not the superstars only, all children. And by implication, their families and speakers this morning and yesterday have been talking about how engagement with families has been key to their success. And I don't know how many people will know this one very famous academic from Canada, Ken Leithwood, some people will know the name talks engagingly about the family pathway to student improvement. There is no improvement without the family pathway. Children spend more time, there was one school leader who said it was different in her school this morning, but children spend more time at home than they do at school. So how can you make families your partners in learning? And then celebrate all talents. Not just, not just the students who do well in the PISA schools. Sport, drama, music, art, the holistic approach that many people have been speaking about in the last day or two. Celebrate them and make those celebrations public. Note those achievements. And then make the leadership process open and accessible and not remote and exclusive. Somebody this morning was talking about the principal's door in their school, or maybe it was in a different school. I find this quite fascinating. When I go to schools, I have the privilege of doing that a lot. What does it say on the principal's door? And very often, particularly in centralized systems, it says on the door the word principal. No name. No name, just principal, not Mrs. this or Mr. that. And what does that tell you? In one symbolic moment, the position is more important than the person. And yet what do we know really about leadership? The individual brings with it their own personality, their own values, their own ways of working, and we cannot clone leaders. So let's keep it personalized as much as we can. Okay, so I want to move on very briefly to something about how we lead. What are the leadership models how we lead? I've got a whole book on this, and I have about two minutes now. So forgive an oversimplistic treatment of some of the models I've discussed at great length. So managerial is one where the bureaucracy is very important and the focus is on formal rules and procedures. And I sigh and groan when I say to someone, why are you doing this? And they say, it's the procedure. 
Cuando le preguntó a alguien, ¿por qué estás haciendo esto? It's the procedure. And if that's the only way you can defend something, you are impoverished. You have to do better than that. It's just the procedure. This is what we call managerialism in educational leadership writing. And managerialism is a dirty word. Please find a better way of defending what you do. Secondly, we have transformational leadership, and I think you will all appreciate, as I have done over the last day and a half, examples of people who are clearly transformational leaders for their schools and their communities. It's been quite inspiring. The problem in, with it, though, with due respect to the wonderful people who've been speaking over the last day and a half, what is the succession plan? If super spa, superstar principal leaves, and we've seen it many, many times in England and elsewhere, the school can rapidly decline because the leadership has been built too firmly about the transformational attributes of that leader. And here is a danger and a trap for all of us. Then we have transactional leadership, a very basic leadership model. I did hear someone speaking about this yesterday as well, who said, if we are only working for the money, then that is not enough. That's a transactional model. That is the contract. You as a teacher or a leader carry out these responsibilities and in return you receive a salary and some other benefits. That's the only reason you're doing it. You're in the wrong job. But of course, we all have our bills to pay. <laughs> I do recognize that as a challenge as well. So it must be there in some extent. And then, during the last day and a half, I think I've heard the distributed leadership phrase used hundreds of times. So hundreds of times. So clearly, it has got some purchase and some impact here in Spain, as it is around the world. I see it everywhere. In the journal that I have the privilege to edit, I receive more articles about distributed leadership than any other kind of leadership. The problem, as with many other aspects of leadership, is the weakness of the definition. What do we mean by distributed leadership? I've heard people say, equate it with shared leadership. Yes, but who is in the sharing process? Who are we sharing with? So in the Malaysia context, I mentioned a recent research project there. It's very clear the sharing is limited to the leadership and management team only. Narrow shared leadership. In some models, we would want to include all teachers. What about the other stakeholders? What about parents? What we might then call extended distributed leadership. What about student voice? I've heard something about this from people on this stage as well. So let's be a bit clearer about that. First of all, who's involved? And secondly, what is the scope of distribution? And what are those items that are excluded from a shared or distributed approach? And we need to do better, I think, globally in identifying those challenges. And then we Oh, I've gone too fast. And then we have moral leadership. And I was interested to see in the various posters outside in the foyer, a reference to moral, ethical, or spiritual leadership. There's one dimension of the program that's being run by colleagues here, because this is where we encapsulate our values. When we step away from our values, we are impoverished. And then finally, instructional leadership, I want to mention very, very briefly, the notion of how do we set about the process of improving teaching and learning in our schools? What are the processes by which we do that? That would be the subject of a presentation all by itself. But it's something we shouldn't lose sight of um, in the whole child development because every child deserves a good teacher. And not, sadly, not every child has a good teacher. Okay, let's move on. I'm seeing two minutes, 17 seconds on my clock. Um, so, contingent leadership then, and this is something that I, I encourage leaders to think about, particularly if they um, are unfortunate enough to be in one of my master's degree classes at the University of Nottingham. All these leadership models we've talked about, including distributed leadership, are partial. They don't paint the whole picture, and so 
there isn't when some people say to me, what, do, what is the best type of leadership? Of course, you cannot give an answer to that because it's contingent on the context. And context is so important, as we've heard over the last day and a half. So what I encourage leaders to do, especially new ones, is to do a really quite systematic situational analysis when they go into schools. What is going on here? And have that as a starting point for deciding how they want to lead. Okay, final slide. Again, could, could easily have a whole session on this. Just to remind everybody, if you need it, and I don't think you do, otherwise you wouldn't have this international symposium, the leadership does make an enormous difference to the learning and the lives of children and young people. And the research that was done in the 19, sorry, in the 2000s in England showed that 27% of the variation in student outcomes was due to leadership. That is a huge amount. So the difference between a good leader and a bad leader makes a huge difference. And as the Leithwood quote shows afterwards, there is no documented case of school improvement without talented leadership. That's why this symposium and all that this project carries with it is so very important and I encourage and applaud it. So it makes that difference and it makes a difference more if it's distributed. This is very simple. More leaders equals more leadership equals more impact potential. Because one person, even the superhero principle, has limitations in terms of what they can do. And the larger the school, the more those limitations become obvious to them. Okay, I've mentioned instructional leadership already and I only have two seconds left. So I will say thank you very much for listening and enjoy the rest of your weekend. Thank you.